committed. All right, so chapter 7 uh, is where disciples are made. Last week we didn't meet, like I said, we had some, some homework you guys could do, some of the extra input in here. Uh, but we spent the last two weeks, before last week, speaking about who makes disciples. And so, is it just the pastor's job? The preaching pastor, is it his job only to make disciples? No. I need more. I need more from you this morning. I need more from you. <laughs> Clearly, I'm dead. Okay, okay, but we have a plurality of elders. So maybe it's the elders only. Is it just the elders' role to make disciples? No. 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 Elders and deacons. We have deacons too. Elders and deacons only. No. no. Every single one of us are called to make disciples. Our job, especially as elders, and then we see, you know, evangelists and church planters, perhaps prophets, um, their job is to equip the saints, which are you guys, to for the work of the ministry. And so discipling uh, needs to be made by all of us, and the equipping comes from the leaders in the church. So let's read through on number 7, chapter 7. We're going to read through. My guess is this, will, this, this chapter will take three weeks, but we'll see as we go through um, somebody start reading for us in our previous six studies. We investigated important questions about discipleship and disciple making. Why we should make disciples, what a disciple actually is, how we go about making disciples, and who does the work. In these final two studies, we're thinking about the field in which disciple making takes place. The where of recruiting, recruiting and teaching learners of Christ. That is, in what context, locations, events, and activities should disciple making take place? Having covered so much ground already, this final subject might not seem quite so important at first, but is actually more important than we might think. One of the barriers to a thoroughgoing disciple making culture in many churches and ministries is a misunderstanding of exactly where disciple making should happen. Good, pause there for a second. This idea, that phrasing in there is something that when we're talking in uh, on the elders meeting sometimes, it's a disciple-making culture. We want the church. It's just always on our mind. We're just constantly thinking about making disciples, making disciples to where if, if somebody comes in, let me give you an example. New person comes in. We have new people come and visit. When they come and they say, you know what, we want to we be around here. We want this to be a place where immediately there is a plan of discipleship for them. Maybe they're coming in and they're becoming a Christian for the first time. Maybe they've been a believer for 20 years and they come in. We don't, you know, depending on the scenario. But we want to make sure that people are equipped to disciple them. And so what it could be is, let's say we have uh, a young, a young single lady who's 21 years old. And she comes and she starts visiting. Okay. Well, in, after she comes, she comes up and says, you know, I really would like to become a member. Great, well, we'll take you through the membership process. And immediately, we want to be thinking as elders saying, okay, who are we going to connect with this young lady? Who's going to start pouring into this young lady immediately? Who's going to say, hey, let's go out for coffee and let's start to talk and find out more about this, this young lady and what she believes and where she's at? We want this to be just kind of known as disciple-making church. That's just what we're doing all the time. Because again, it goes back to what we've been studying. That's the command. The command is to make disciples. So we want to be known as a disciple If we're just here and we're just getting together, and even if we're only, and we don't, fellowship is a part of that, but we don't want to be just a fellowshipping church only. Okay, that's a part of discipleship. It's what, one of the means of disciple-making, but we want to make sure we're intentional with what we're doing as far as disciple making. Um, continue reading, please. You're doing a great job. For many churches, making disciples has two main locations. Firstly, when it comes to making disciples of all nations, it's common for this to be viewed mainly as a missionary enterprise that should be taking place literally in the other nations. That is, in an overseas location somewhere. For many churches, a great commission commitment means having a missions budget, supporting overseas mission agencies, praying for missionaries, and so on. The often understated and misguided assumption is that the nations, that is the people over there in other countries, need to hear the gospel and become disciples of Jesus. 
but that somehow our own location, our street or suburb or community is less of a concern. Okay, so category one, generally speaking, when churches are thinking about making disciples, category one, the nation's over there. Disciple making needs to happen over there. Now, obviously, we're going to see how that plays in to what we were doing last week. Uh, but that's generally, it's just right now laying out, generally two categories when churches think, all right, we need to make disciples. All right, someone needs to handle overseas, and then the second category. Next person, pick up there, secondly. Secondly, the default understanding in many churches is that local discipleship takes place in a private location. Discipling is usually seen as personal intimate work. It happens in one-to-one -one meetings, in coffee shops, and long walks where we talk about our Christian lives, or perhaps in small groups that meet in people's homes. For many people, discipling is often particularly associated with spending time with new believers to ground them in the basics of the faith. Accordingly, if we wanted to improve discipleship or discipling in our church, we would mainly be thinking about places or context outside of our regular Sunday church gatherings. Having looked at Matthew 28 and the Great Commission multiple, multiple times throughout these studies, you'll know that Jesus explicitly locates the field of discipleship as the nations, Matthew 28, 19. But who or what exactly is he referring to and where do the nations fit in God's long-term plans? Where exactly should discipleship happen? Yeah. Uh, the next one I have is Genesis 11 reports. Okay. Genesis 11 reports the construction of the Tower of Babel, which led God to confuse the languages of the people and disperse them all over the earth as a judgment for their godless pride. Okay, everyone remember the story of the Tower of Babel? Some of you guys who were there Sunday night, we actually ended up walking through a whole bunch of scriptures about the nations. We started in Psalm 2 and we actually walked all the way back, all the way, back. All the way to Genesis. Um, really, what, chapter 2 when it was saying, or chapter 1 when it was saying, um, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay, so the idea even from the beginning there was that the whole earth would worship the Lord. And then we saw the flood where he wipes out just about everybody. But then he says to talks to Noah and them and says, okay, now populate the whole earth again, right? The whole earth is supposed to worship the Lord. Well, then you get into Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel, and because of their pride, the Lord confuses their languages and spreads them out. Okay? And then right after that is Genesis 12. Let's look at Genesis 12, 1 through 3. We did this the other night, for the, but I know many of you weren't able to be there. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And Genesis 17, go ahead and mark them both. So he has just confused the language, languages of all the people because of their pride at the Tower of Babel. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, this is before he's changed his name to Abraham, um, when he's first calling him. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Verse 2. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So all the families that were just spread out in the previous chapter, them and all the families that will come will be blessed through Abraham. That's the... The promise there, if you will. Now flip over to 17, a couple pages over. Genesis 17, 1 through 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Verse 3, then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your, your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall rise from you. And I will establish my covenant, we've heard that word a lot, between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be 
God to you and your offspring. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, and everlasting possession, and I will be their God. All right. The first one in Genesis 12, now in Genesis 17, this is where he's making the covenant, and he's saying, all the nations, I'm making you the father of many nations. How is that happening? How, does, how do we see that actually take place? How does he fulfill that? How does God fulfill that? Sarah has a baby. What's that? Sarah has a baby. Sarah has a baby. Good. It, now, is it through faith? Correct. So, Abraham has Isaac. Is it Isaac that blesses all the nations? Jacob? No. Judah? Yes. David? <laughs> Christ. It's specifically referring to Christ as the way that all the nations would be blessed. Let's see, question two here, it has quickly read Matthew 1, 2, 8, 10, 13, and 24. And then from that, we would answer some of those questions. So let's look, look at that real quick. Go to Matthew, and I'll read them. So you've got to stay up with me. I'm going to flip quick and read them. Get to Matthew 1 first. Keep your fingers on the papers. Or on your phone. It's a little easier, I guess, maybe for that. I don't know. All right. We'll read through these quickly. Matthew 1.1. 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So right away, Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is showing us the connection from Abraham to Jesus, which is important because that is answering the question and tying Jesus all the way back to Abraham. So sometimes when you read the genealogies, we go, what is this in here for? What are we here? We're just reading the Hebrew phone book? What is going on here? No, there's, it's important. Every, every word in Scripture is important. And so as you read through and study through, there's things. If you know your Old Testament, that'll pop up, and you'll see God's faithfulness. This is a, a tracking, really, of God's faithfulness. Matthew 2, 1 through 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born? King of the Jews, for we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. So, people from far off come in to worship there. Matthew chapter 8. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come, watch this, from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And, the centurion said, and to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. What is he saying in that? What, 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 what do we see revealed in that passage? Man of faith. Man of faith. Was he one of the... Was he from the house of Israel? No. 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 And Jesus is actually going, hey, in the house of Israel, I haven't seen faith like this. Yeah. Okay? Make, showing us again from these passages the nations. Okay? And that's what he says there, right? From the east and the west, all are going to be coming. And, does it in, and there is, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. Okay? And that's where we see that there are quite a few from the nation of Israel, Jewish people, who are not believing. Now it does seem, as we went through the book of Romans, that there will be an awakening among them. And there are some now, even Paul was Jewish, right? There are some who were Christians. But especially this, this idea right now, that was part of the mystery when we went through the book of Romans, was that there was this hardening among Israel so that the Gentiles would come in, and that was God's work. <clears throat> Let's go to 10.18. I'm 
I'm going to start in 16. Behold, I'm sending you out. This is to his uh, followers. As sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them uh, and the Gentiles. Gentiles, everyone who's not Jewish, right? Not of Israel. Flip over to 13, Matthew 13. 38. Again, going to start in 36. He had just given the parable of the weeds. So that's the context here. And talking about those who sow, the sower that goes among the weeds. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came and saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Even his disciples at times didn't understand what he was teaching. Right? He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. So who sows the seed? Jesus is the one who sows the seed. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And so he sows the seed, and those who believe are part of the kingdom from all nations. Now, now he sows the seed through us as we take that the gospel, this, the seed would be the word of God. As we take that out, people believe. Last one in Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, a challenging chapter, maybe the most challenging chapter in the, well, probably the book of Matthew. Maybe, well, some could argue in, in, in all of Scripture. So we won't get in deeply into the different interpretations of it. But with uh, verse 14, he's talking about, just so you know, this is signs of how the, end, the when the world will end or what's going to happen, the end of the age. Okay. And so part of that, that's what he says, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The ending is linked to the nations hearing the gospel. Isn't that interesting? That's how important it is that we reach the nations because it's linked to that. Why? Because again, as we talked uh, a few, maybe a month or two ago, the bricks in the temple are bricks from all over the world, the multitude of every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so that has to be the vision there. So now, the question that they posed after we read those, how does Matthew show that Jesus came to fulfill the promise to Abraham to include the nations in God's kingdom? From those passages, how does the book of Matthew show us that Jesus is the fulfillment of that? What were some of the things that we just read? The last one. Last one's a pretty oh, clear one there. There are other passages you could passages you could have gone to, but those were just some that he has there. Now that he has two more passages of Matthew that he recommends that we read, and they're tied to Old Testament prophecy. So let's see what that looks like. Stay in Matthew. Go back to Matthew chapter 4. Go back to Matthew chapter 4. Jesus has just been baptized, tempted, and now he's beginning his ministry. Okay, I'm going to start in verse 12, Matthew chapter 4, beginning at 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Speaking about John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. Okay, I know we like to claim him. He's a little bit of a weird one to claim, though. <laughs> You'll take him? Yeah. All right. In leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. So this is from the book of Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. 
From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All the way back, probably six, seven hundred years before Jesus is there, Isaiah is writing and saying, In this region, there would be those who would believe. So Jesus going to the Gentiles is fulfilling Scripture. Okay. The next one, Matthew 12. Have somebody else read this one. Matthew 12, 18 through 21. Start in 15 for us, though. Jesus is going through doing many miracles, many signs that are pointing to the fact that he's the Messiah. Somebody read Matthew 12, 18 or 15 through 21. I'm going to start with 14. No, no, okay. Somewhere. Okay. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Okay, they want to kill Jesus. Yeah. Okay, Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him, and he, he, he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. Now, wait, just stop right there. You got when it says that. Don't read over that quickly. He he withdraws. People follow, so he still has compassion on them, and he heals. And then he says. Go make sure you tell everybody that I healed you. He doesn't do that. You ever think about if you read through the Gospels carefully and a lot of things, why does Jesus use parables? Because we're too stupid to understand it otherwise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, parables are harder to tell that thing than that. So that the people that are supposed to understand won't understand. Right. It, it, it's literally Jesus uses parables so only those who have ears to hear would understand. Isn't that crazy? And so even sometimes the disciples go, wait, what did that mean? <laughs> go, All right, you guys are supposed to understand. Come here, I have to explain this one, Jesus. You're, you're supposed to get this. But here he's saying, no, 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 don't, don't go tell everybody. A lot of this is linked to his time hadn't come yet to go to the cross. Okay? His time hadn't come yet. So he's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Just, just hold on there. Okay, continue. From Isaiah again. Isaiah, we're Yeah, yeah, but he's quoting Isaiah. I mean, he's quoting Isaiah. <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name the nations will put their hope. There you go. Prophecies out of Isaiah, again, about the nations trusting in Christ. All right, last one here, and then we'll get into We're going to do the extra input today. I think it's helpful. Uh, flip over to Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Go right in your Bibles to Ephesians. Ephesians 2, we're going to read 11 through 18. But just before 11 through 18 is a real famous passage we have read many times, quoted many times. Uh, some of you know this passage well. Some of you memorized it. Some of you have tattoos about it. Um, by grace through faith, right? We were dead in our trespasses and sin. We're made alive. God, in His great mercy and His love, He's made us alive. It's by grace we're saved, not works, right? So that way nobody can boast. That's what He just got done saying. And then He says that we're God's workmanship. We're created for good works. Now, verse 11, okay? Somebody else read verse 11 through, verses 11 through 18. Go ahead. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near to the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, 
by killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to one spirit to the Father. Okay. Those who are far off. How many of you are, that the best you know, are Jewish? You are descended from Israel, like ethnically. Okay, so you're, most of us in here would be Gentiles. And that's what this passage is talking about us. We were far off. And Christ came and brought us in. And so it's a, a joyous thing. When you see Gentiles, you can say, oh, that's, that's talking about me. That's talking about most of us. And you see again that it was his plan from the beginning. Now, let's do this extra input and see what else is said about the nations. We tend to think of the nations as overseas countries, but that is not really what Jesus had in mind. He was talking about the peoples of the world, all the massive variety of nations and tribes and tongues and races, out of which Old Testament Israel was called to be God's treasured possession among all peoples, his holy nation, out of Exodus 19. This non-Jewish rest of the world is routine, routinely called the nations or Gentiles in the New Testament. Perhaps we can start to feel what a radical and shocking statement this might have been for the 11 disciples there on the mountain with Jesus when we consider not only all that they had witnessed, but also all their expectations about God and his people. The Jewish Messiah had risen from the grave to save his people and to be a ruler of all, but his commission to them was not to make disciples of Israel in particular, but of the nations, those who were far off, as we just read. The pagans, the very people who were considered so unclean and defiled that a Jew was not even allowed to eat with them. It was a commission to make disciples of the enemy, of the despised heathens who had defeated and oppressed Israel for centuries. Think about that. That's who he says... Make disciples of them when he's talking. How would that, how would, what, what does that conjure up in your mind as we're reading that? Scared. What's that? You would be scared. Yes, good. They probably would have been scared. That's why before, when he kept teaching them, especially when you go through John's account, he kept telling them, don't worry, I'll be sending you the helper. Right? I'll be giving you the, the Holy Spirit. And then at the end of the Great Commission, he says, Behold, I'm with you. Always, or even to the end of the age. So, they would have been like, Huh? These people that have done all this bad stuff to us are enemies? You want us to go and make disciples of them? And he goes, Don't worry, I'm with you. <coughs> yeah, other thoughts here? On what comes to mind? Disbelief. Probably not like disbelief. Oh, maybe he misspoke. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, Hey, what? Matthew, what did you hear him say? Because I thought I heard him say something different. There might be some some disbelief there. Yeah? I don't think they were excited, though. You don't think they were excited? <laughs> they probably weren't. Yes, now we get to go to the nations and, all, and reach them all. That was part of what happened when Jesus came, right? Everyone there, most of the people, they were excited that Jesus was there at first, right? On Palm Sunday when he comes in, everyone's excited. Hey, lay on the palm branches. Jesus is here. Why were they excited? Were they excited that, oh, we're going to be delivered from our sin? Is that was, was that the idea? No, what were they excited about? He was going to make an earthly king. The king is returning, and finally, seriously, finally, those guys over there are going to get it. That's really what they were thinking. These Romans, they're going to get it finally. And Jesus is like, yeah, you're actually going to go and make disciples of them. Wait, what? <laughs> and that's why people rejected him. They didn't want that king. They didn't want salvation for them. They want it just for us. It's all about it. We're just going to keep it ourselves. And if we're not careful, that's how the church can be. It's for us. Almost like a little the ring in the Lord of the Rings. It's our precious. If you've ever seen the movie. <laughs> Instead of, oh, we, we get to go share this with as many people as possible. Every reason no. Well, I was going to say, they hated the Samaritans worse than they hated the Gentiles, and they were part of Jews. So yeah. they, you know, they 
really <laughs> didn't want to go to the Samaritan. Right. Something that occurred to me the other day when we had the students in, that because of our time overseas, I, I don't think this way, but somebody, I forget who we were talking about, but somebody we were talking, and they said, do you think it's hard for some of your church members? It's like, well, no, we want to reach the nation. So, yeah, but they're Chinese there. Th seriously, think about how often we're told and we view the Chinese as building their army to take over. And all of a sudden, they're in our sanctuary with us. Some we had from Iran. There are Muslims there. People from India. And in the world we live in, there's we're Americans, and these are other nations that we've been at war with before. And I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> Not that we wouldn't still do it. We're supposed to do it. That's the point. Like We're seeing from Scripture, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Now, that doesn't mean we stop being Americans, but realizing that that's a conflict in our own hearts right there because of how just different and just so you know, the Jewish people weren't that different. They were going, uh, we're not really excited about these people, Jesus. Come in and set us up. And he's saying, no, you're going to serve them. And that's what we were able to do. And so think of how many times, being honest, just think for a moment, how many times you have negative, in a negative way spoken about these other countries. Now, again, I'm not saying their government isn't trying to do things. Yeah, all oh, that's true. Yeah, whatever. But we've done it. And now they're in there and we're, we're praying and asking God to save them and you're hosting in, in your home. I'm glad you didn't teach on this to Sunday before they came. <laughs> <laughs> I've been right there in my mind. <laughs> Trust God's providence in this, right? I think the heart yeah, but we're, we're starting this from a But you weren't even thinking about it. No. Because no. it was a different category. No. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I think one of the hardest things for a lot of Christians, and especially depending on uh, your generation, yeah. is salvation is for your enemies also. Yeah. Is that, that mindset that Christ died for your enemies just like he died for you. Yeah. Uh, and, and really, and really biblically, going back to the Ephesians passage, <laughs> before you're in Christ, you're on their team. <laughs> you're one of the enemies. Not enemies of, you know, you're, you're saying enemies here as far as generation right. wars we've had. That's in the U.S. to see right. anything past America. Right. Sure. It's and, and a hard I, thing. Yeah. And I think it's true for the Israelites at that time. Did you? That's why I'm making the point. And it'd be true if you're in another country, right? If you live in another country, oh, we don't get along with them because we've had wars and things. And so then to say, well, I want to go be a missionary to them. Right? Those who those who shot my grandfather and killed him. And now I want to, I want to take the gospel there. Right? That, that's got to be something different. You have to have a whole different perspective. And so that's what the, the point that they're making here. Uh, but even the uh, throughout the Old Testament, we're midway through the extra input here. God had always been concerned with the fate of the nations. In many ways, the story of the Old Testament is the story of Israel being called out from among the nations as God's special and holy treasure possession in order that they might be a blessing to the nations. That was the point, Israel. I'm calling you out. You're going to have special diets. You're going to have special ways of worship. You're going to have special ways of worship. You're going to do all these things that will make you unique among the nations to be a light among the nations, to reach the nations. That was the plan. To be a blessing to the nations, a kingdom of priests to represent God to the world. Exodus 19, 1-6 makes this clear. The reason God had redeemed Israel out of Egypt to be his own treasured possession was in order for them to be a kingdom of priests, to mediate God to the nations. The ultimate vocation of Israel was to be the vehicle of salvation and light and blessing to the whole earth. 
What's interesting is today, the country, I'm talking about the country of Israel at this point, is constantly at war. Now, that's, I'm not saying it's all on them. They're constantly at war. But many there do not believe in Christ. In fact, many have become atheists or agnostic, not even following the God of the Old Testament. But that goes back to why is that happening? So that now the church is taking the gospel to the nations. That includes going into, we have missionaries we're sending into Israel to try and go share with them because they need to hear the gospel as well. And again, there will be an awakening seemingly from what Romans talks about, Romans 11. Sadly, Israel repeatedly fails in this vocation and ends up being more like a curse than a blessing to the nations. The prophets arise and declare judgment, right? All the prophets, what do they do? We, that's what the book of Daniel we went through. What was that? It was the judgment on Israel for them not doing that. Instead, they worship false gods instead of the true God. They actually end up worshiping, so they got evangelized. Instead of them evangelizing the nations and showing who Yahweh is, the true God, they began to worship those people's gods. Now let's point that right back to us. As the church is to be a light to the nations, we're to be reaching them and get them to worship Christ. And then how often are we being evangelized? Well, you're constantly being evangelized by the world. But how often are we giving in to and we start worshiping the false gods around us? What would the false gods around us be? Now, there would be some of the religions. could be Islam. But most Christians don't convert to Islam. We don't start worshiping there. What would be the, the false gods or idols that we worship? Or get convinced to, huh? Money. money. So we're supposed to be a light and show how Jesus is greater than money. It's not even an issue. So come, you know, Jesus is so much better. And then we get evangelized by the world on money. And then we start worshiping the God of money. Good one. What else? What would be another one? Saved by works and not by faith. Works. Yeah. The world would say this is how you have to be saved. Works. And we buy into it. Instead of telling them, no, no, it's by grace, it's by grace. We get evangelized and sometimes slide over there. We're not that different than what Israel was doing. Now be careful here. We're not like, ooh, Israel, not you know. Eh, eh. See, what else? Any others? Self. Self. Man, you are getting evangelized. Watch a Disney movie. You're getting evangelized. You are. You are. The good is within you. Follow your heart. You just got to get to, if you could get away all those other things that have influenced you, especially bad things like religion, and get, get to your inner and true self, then you'll be okay. You're being evangelized. We are being evangelized all the time. And the difference that we're supposed to be is the light and saying, no, 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 that's not how it is. But instead, we at times get pulled into that and we go right along with it. So we're to be a light to the nations. <clears throat> the prophets arise and declare judgment on the people of Israel for their rebelliousness and faithlessness and declare that Israel will be exiled and scattered among the nations because of its sin. But at the same time, the prophets look forward to a time when God would send His servant through whom Israel would finally be truly a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth, Isaiah 49.6. Thus, when Jesus calls on the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, it is a climactic moment in salvation history. The Messiah has come. He has died. He has been raised as the Savior and King, not only of Israel, but of all the nations, of every tribe and clan and culture in all the earth. Now he sends out his learners, the disciples, those who have turned back to him and have been forgiven and have devoted themselves to learning his ways to make other learners who will do the same. In other words, the community of learners that Jesus is building now functions as the royal priesthood that Israel was always meant to be. We are called out of the world while still living in the world in order that we might proclaim Christ. Now this is what Peter said for Peter time. But you are this isn't just talking about Israel. This is talking about believers. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own 
possession. That, why are you a chosen race? Why are you a royal priesthood? Why are you a holy nation? Why has he made you his possession? Part of this is that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. The reason is that when I called you out, you're supposed to proclaim him to all the nations. That's why you exist. If you're not, if we're not doing that, then we're not. What, what are we? What are we here for? Like, according to scripture, that's why we exist. Now we do that through working and all kinds of different things. But think of just think about it. When you even evangelize to another American, you are you are evangelizing to the nations because they're not they're part of the Gentiles too. But that doesn't mean we only focus right in our neighborhood. Question five: As we make disciples. How are we connected to God's promise of a blessing to the nations in Abraham? So as we make disciples, as we're, we're discipling people, in what ways are we connected to, that, to, to God's promise he made back to Abraham? How are, how, how are we connected to that as individuals and as a church when we make disciples? We're obeying him. We're obeying him, good. That obedience is actually how that promise is working out. He makes a promise. Abraham, through you, someone your seed is going to bless all the nations. Christ then says, all right, you guys, go be a blessing to all the nations, because I've died for you and I've risen for you. Go be a blessing to all the nations. So when we do that, the means in which God has promised, for that promise to come fulfill, fulfillment, the means are us. We are the means God is using to fulfill the Abrahamic promise. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. What's that? Which makes us inheritors into the, the uh, covenant. Well, right, the, the exactly. With Abraham. Yeah, so the, the covenant, the, the promise to Abraham, was also specifically to Christ. That's what Galatians talks about and explains. And you're in Christ as part of the nations, and so you are receiving the blessings of the covenant as well. The covenant with Abraham is not just about the Jewish people. It's about, as Paul would phrase it, all who is true Israel. Now, who's true Israel? Those who have faith like Abraham. And so that's why those blessings are for Christ and those who are in Christ. And so it's, it becomes fulfilled as the means when we go and do it. Verse, uh, question 6. Given that the nation refers to all the peoples of the world rather than overseas countries, what might this mean for your church in making disciples? So when it means all peoples of the world... It doesn't just mean overseas countries. How, how can this make us think differently? All peoples of Cedar King. All peoples of Cedar King. Good. Definitely. Anybody you meet. Anybody you meet. Good. So it's not just we need to get a missionary and send them over there to make disciples of all nations and they'll do that job and we'll pray and we'll send some money with them. It's all of us all the time, focusing on anybody we meet, making disciples, that's fulfilling the Great Commission. See the difference there? The different mentality. Yes, Ms. Lana. Isn't that what we were doing with the students? Yeah. Absolutely. That's part of it. It's evangelizing in Cedar Key and, and any, anyone else that God has given us influence with. There are certain people, Ms. Wanda, that you know, that trust you, that I don't know. And so you have the relationship and you get to share and make disciples, hopefully, with those people. And I make some over here and you're making some over there. We're all making But then we also know that there are some peoples that they don't even have, we talk about this, access to the gospel. Those students who came here, they live in countries where there's not even a church around. Now, the internet has helped in some ways to have access to the gospel, but also a lot of bad teaching too. And so when we get them, when they get here to the United States, we want to use that opportunity also to, to do that very thing. That's true. Yeah. Other thoughts? Let me ask you something. Are they constricted to stay in Gainesville while they're here at school? No. They can come and go? So they come and go as much as they want. There's no reason they can come over here every Sunday they want. They want. If they wanted to, they could. Yep. They don't have train. A lot of them. That's true. A lot of them don't have cars. So, they, But if they had a car, they could come or they could carpool. Uh, but no, they're not restricted. The problem is, though, and if you've ever lived overseas or gone overseas, part is you don't know people, and so you don't invite yourself things. You don't know what you can do or can't do. For them, that's a foreign idea. So that's part of the of the ministry that they have is opening up their arms and saying, hey, we want to welcome you. And what Craig and their team does is they do introduce them to 
other churches that are closer, partnering churches. What's sad is there's a bunch of Gainesville and they're not willing to even partner with them because it's our precious. That's for missionaries to do. It's just in their mindset of that's somebody else's job. And it's like, no, no, God, like Ms. Wanda said, God's brought them there and you have an opportunity. And so that's part of why now we have the island, which is also unique. But the fact that you would open up your homes, we would show hospitality, kind of invites them more and gives makes them more comfortable. And so that's part of that. Yeah, that's wrong. I think a big thing is we don't always really understand the assignment, meaning we're called to make disciples of all nations. But if I have three people sitting here that I'm pouring into making disciples, I don't know which one of them three that God's going to use to go to be a missionary. Also there too. And so we, as we started off this morning, who who is the sower? It's Christ. He's the one. Our assignment is just to tell them about the sower, the Christ. I mean, and to build them up and to teach them this way. So sometimes I think when we think of discipling or missions, that that aspect is it's odd, that, uh, that automatic. Well, I, I don't have a calling to go over seas. Yeah. Uh, you know, or you may use that as an excuse. Well, I want to go over seas and I want to make disciples of nations, but you're not doing it right. now. Yeah. So a good a good me- a good measure of whether somebody honestly and and and, there, and I will be honest, there are some ways that it's easier when you are overseas in another context because you're twenty four seven going. I need I'm here to share. Okay, but part of the International Mission Board and other agencies, whenever they're trying to help a church decide if somebody is, you know, should be sent overseas, you start to say, well, who have you shared the gospel with? Last six months, who have you shared with? Well, nobody. And you want to go to Africa somewhere, and or Haiti, and you want to go share the gospel there. Well, yeah, I have a heart for the nations. <laughs> It's a long way of thinking. The nations are all around us. We are, we're part of the nations, and there's our opportunities, like we saw last weekend. And so, just be faithful with anyone that God has put in your life. Grandkids, kids, neighbors, whatever, just be faithful. And let God do His work. I just want to do seven and eight before we close. The Great Commission is the climactic moment in salvation history. Question seven. The culmination of God's plans to save people from all tribes, tongues, and races. How does this shape your understanding of the place that disciple making should have in the lives of all God's people, including your own life? As we've talked about this already, we should know that we are a part of this thing. Every believer is a part of it. And that's the expectation. So, how would we answer the question so far on this on this chapter? Where should disciples be made? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Including overseas, but also all around us. Okay, Next so that's... Door. What's that? Next door. Next door. So that's why sometimes with some of the things we've written or say or whatever it is, we talk about trying to reach our neighbors and the nations. Neighbors and So all around, just constantly. If everybody could think again, Lord willing, if we had, we were faithful to proclaim the gospel regularly... If each one of us, if God used each one of us to win one person to Christ, we wouldn't even fit in our church anymore. Isn't that crazy? One one person here, negative relationships, otherwise. But one person here, we wouldn't even fit on a Sunday morning anymore. And that person did one. And then one, yeah, one, and one. That's how that's how God designed it. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. But going back to why we're doing the study, what it's gone back to is, well, that's the pastor's job. Right? Well, let's bring them to the church, and that's, you know, bring them to the worship service, and that's where the. No, no, you're making disciples, you're reaching people, and then you bring them in to come and worship together. But it's really your guys' witness, your guys' job. You're the, the, the priesthood of believers that are supposed to be out there, interceding and sharing. And so that's when you start to go, okay, God, who do you have for me today? <laughs> and he answers that one. I got to tell you all a story. I. I... And I don't want y'all to think by any means that I'm bragging about that because I'm not. Because I was reading Romans one morning, so I was out in the shop, 
And God convicted me, and I was sitting there praying, and I said, God, put somebody in my uh, in my area today so that I can witness to them. Yeah. And I just sitting there in my pajamas, read my Bible and all that, and praying. Next thing I know, God says, sitting here, somebody out in your yard. <laughs> so I knew Mike was out there, and I could hear Justin bring the sun off from across the street. And I said, well, Lord, I haven't even had a shower. I don't have my makeup on. Mm -hmm. And he said, send me go. Mm -hmm. I did. Cried the whole way. I cried now. That God specifically said, go right now. Yeah. And if I hadn't gone, I don't know what I'd how I felt. Right. Yeah. Anyway, That's I it. got a witness to Justin. Yeah. And again, also remember this. You might say, God, send me somebody. Watch. Evangelize. Yes. Send me somebody to disciple. Yeah. Because here's what else might happen. Debbie might call. And she might say, Cindy, you got a few minutes? That's a discipleship moment. I need to talk with you. Because what are we doing there? Well, we're going to talk about life. And then Cindy's going to give ins insight from the scriptures. And that's discipleship. So making disciples of all nations is actually, which we're going to get into next week and things, is actually what we're doing even now and when you guys are together. So it's evangelism plus teaching and discipling. Okay? It's both together. That's what we're talking about. All right. Let's pray. We need to get next.